do is a uh, 20 uh, 2009 uh, B number three and 2008 number one A. Um, and so these are the kind of old, old, old school questions. And so um, these ones are just going to be very content based. So that's going to just be completely based on your knowledge level of water properties as well as protein structure. Um, so let's dive first into our protein structure. So this question is about water properties. And so we have to think about water and we have to think about the different things we know about water. So water is made of hydrogen and oxygen. We know that attached to each of the oxygens is a hydrogen by a polar covalent bond. It's polar because of the fact that there's an unequal share of these valence electrons. Um, oxygen is partially negative and hydrogen is partially positive. Um, and so based on that, we need to then connect it to different properties. And then also part B, we're going to kind of explain different phenomena, like the role of water as a media, um, ability of water to moderate temperature, and movement of water from roots up to the leaves and the plants. So let's first think about properties of water. So we already talked about the polarity of water. And we can also think about what does that polarity give us? Well, it gives us cohesion, the ability for water molecules to bind to other water molecules, as well as adhesion, water molecules binding to other polar substances. We can also bring up about the fact that when those hydrogen bonds become locked in the lattice structure for um, a solid, um, that there's this space in between which causes the kind of, it to take up more, more volume, which causes the uh, density of ice to be less than the density of liquid water. And so there's a lot of different things that we're looking for here. You can talk about the polarity, you talk about specific heat, you can mention about how water can absorb a large amount of heat energy without a change in temperature. So it takes like 4.184 joules of energy to relate to cause it to increase one degree Celsius. Um, or I think it's one gram to uh, increase one degree Celsius. Um, also think about heat vaporization. It requires a lot of energy in order to vaporize it. Um, and that brings us into evaporative cooling that we'll talk about in a little bit. Adhesion, attraction of other molecules that are polar or um, other substances that um, are charged. Um, cohesion, the attraction to other water molecules due to that polar nature, and you could bring up the surface tension to it. Also, you could bring up three states of matter. My students traditionally can't get this one. Although we talk about it's expanding at four degrees Celsius, they miss that there's three states of matter for water. Um, and then repelling hydrophobic material. We know that the, the definition of hydrophobic means water fearing, so it's going to kind of move away from it. So what did the student say on this one? So it said the water is universal solvent. Polar nature allows it to break down ionic bonds as well as polar covalent bonds. No other substance is able to dissolve the same variety of substances. So it's talking about polarity here and it's talking about being a universal solvent. Um, water has a high heat capacity due to its hydrogen bonding between the hydrogen um, of one molecule to the oxygen of other molecules. So that talks about higher uh, about hydrogen bonding and how that produces the um, high heat of vaporization and produces the high specific heat. It results in a large amount of energy required to raise water temperature by one degree Celsius. Then goes on and they talk about cohesion, adhesion, other properties of water result from hydrogen bonds. So talking about that the cohesion refers to water's ability to attach to other water molecules um, and adhesion dealing with water binding to other substances that are polar. And they go into a lot of details about the anatomy of the plant. Keep in mind that this was back when they had to know the anatomy of the plant. So you're not going to be expected to know about the trichids or are you going to have to know about the xylem. And then it says the water exhibits uh, surface tension, which is a type of cohesion um, where water molecules surface bind to each other, um, producing the surface, uh, making the, the uh, piercing the surface difficult. Um, that results in the ability to fill glass slightly over without spilling over. OK, so that brought in the properties of water that they were looking for. Now we have to look at each of these specifically. So the role of water is in media. So the student is going to end up going on the wrong tangent with this, but what they wanted you to talk about was diffusion, how water can move uh, from aqueous uh, solution from higher concentration to lower concentration, talking about osmosis moving across membranes due to water potential, talking about the solvent and how it can um, dissociate different materials or it can ionize materials. So because of the oxygen being partially negative and the hydrogen being partially positive, if there is sodium chloride, that is a cation and an anion, you're going to see that it's going to dissociate or break apart into those ions. Um, you also talk about how buffering and it can uh, explain its role in formation of bicarbonate. Um, so we know that when carbon oxide goes into water, it produces carbonic acid. Um, and so that bicarbonate ion is going to be able to kind of buffer to maintain pH at the same level. So the student does go on a whole big tangent. They talk about photosynthesis and providing electrons necessary for photons of light. 
Um, they also talk about that it's important for dissolving substances, um, but the they didn't actually get any credit for talking about this because they didn't go all the way in depth about the water potential. So you have to make sure you are using thorough explanations. Um, so then talking about the ability of water to moderate temperature, that brings us back to specific heat. We can moderate the climate, produce uh, stable temperatures in cells, and of course, con uh, constant internal environment. Looking at evaporative cooling, um, because of the fact that it's the high uh, heat of vaporization, when you sweat and all that sweat is all over your skin, is the heat from your skin is going to break those uh, hydrogen bonds between water molecules, causing your liquid water to become a water vapor. So it brings the heat away with it. As well as looking at ice forming and acting as insulator for lakes. Um, so when the water freezes, it's going to, of course, float. And because of the fact that it floats, it creates kind of a barrier stopping that cold air from getting to the rest of the lake. Um, so the life forms that live in the water are going to be able to survive the winter. So it talks about water's ability to moderate temperatures. Um, water's high specific heat enables it to function as an absorber of heat inside of the organism's body. And then they go on to mention about the high heat of vaporization allows the body to cool by rapid cooling um, and so on and so forth. So then the last part is the movement of water from the roots to the leaves. So this had to do with transpiration. Transpiration has to do with evaporation at the leaves. So because of the evaporation at the leaves, it's then going to cause a negative pressure at the leaves, which then kind of pulls the water up. And it has to do with that water potential and specifically looking at the pressure potential. Then we talk about capillary action, the cohesion due to the water molecules being attached to one another, as well as the adhesion of the water molecules being attached to the capillary tubes of the um, plant. Root pressure, there's a high amount of pressure in the soil, which kind of, kind of forces it and pushes it up. And then that negative pressure potential that we mentioned with the transpiration. So they go really in depth with this. They talk about how it's hinged upon the vaporization of cohesion and adhesion. Um, they talk about water being pushed up a short distance in the root. So they're talking about that root structure. Um, and that forms that continuous pillar from leaf to root because of cohesion. When a raw molecule evaporates off a lot of transpiration, as then pulled up a whole pillar, then pinches upward because of cohesion. This allows water to reach its destiny. Okay. So that gets us all the way through the water properties one. So we're going to look at just 1A for protein structure, which is in um, 2008. They then want to talk about the three types of bonds that we're going to see in proteins. So as a quick refresher, we have four different um, structures of protein folding. Your primary structure is just your string of amino acids with peptide bonds between them. Your secondary structure has to do with the alpha helix or the beta pleated sheet. And this has to do with hydrogen bonding between the backbone. Your tertiary structure is going to be a final three-dimensional structure that you have with your one polypeptide, and this has to do with the R group's binding. And so any bond you know, co uh, sorry, covalent, ionic, hydrogen, van der Waals, hydrophobic interaction, disulfide linkages, any bond you know can occur as long as it's taking place between the R groups. And then quaternary has to do with when we're looking at multiple different uh, polypeptides and their R groups interacting. So what they wanted you to do was describe the different types of bonds and then give a role associated with it. And so looking at the cohesion, uh, sorry, covalent, looking at the, the sharing electrons, linking amino acids together, giving you primary dulcified linkages, which is a type of covalent bond is within the tertiary or the quaternary due to that R group. Hydrogen bond, you had to describe hydrogen bonds between um, a electronegative atom, specifically oxygen that's bonded to a hydrogen that is attracted to another electronegative atom like an oxygen or a nitrogen that we see somewhere else in the backbone. Um, van der Waals, the unequal electron clouds that you see with the R groups, hydrophobic interaction, looking at the uh, nonpolar R groups, as well as ionic, looking at your charged R groups. So the person goes on and they talk all in depth about your gamma sulfur, the sulfur is going to form a covalent bond with another uh, cytosine that would then form the disulfide linkage. We know that there is a lot of strength in this, and that then allows us to get into the tertiary structure. They do mention a wrong statement here of secondary, but since it doesn't take away from their ability to say correct stuff, I believe they were able to get that point. Um, and then it says that it uh, stabilizes the protein structure and can then offer, you know, overall stability. They then go on to talk about van der Waals, and they give an in-depth uh, explanation about the electron orbitals of them um, and how there's kind of these weak forces called London dispersion. Um, and then they continue to go on and talk about the nonpolar amino acids clumping together on the interior of the proteins, and agglutination then plays a, a major role in the formation of quaternary structure. They then talk about the hydrogen bonds and how there's a polar bond between the oxygen, nitrogen, or fluorine. It then results in that, of course, strong bond. H bonds are critical in the helixes that we see with the alpha helix, as well as we see it with the beta linkage. Um, and so since they're talking about secondary structures, they get the point right.